Okay, thank you all for coming. This is going to be an interactive talk, so you're always welcome to participate. I will give you a glimpse of algebraic geometry, and I will illustrate what it is when applied to Pythagorean triples. Pythagorean triples, this will be a difficult problem, but we start with the basics. In fact, let's start with the most basic object in mathematics. What is it? The simplest of all. Simplest object. You have studied mathematics by now for over a decade, so whatever that basic object is, you have seen it. Yes? A point. Point, that's a good uh, answer. That's a good answer, yes? I would say triangle. A triangle. Now, mm, let's figure out, is the point more basic than the triangle? Yes, so the triangle is made out of points. So, so far we take point. Does anyone have a different answer? Or do you all agree that it is the point? Yes? A number, yes, a number. A number is very basic. What can be more basic than a number? So we have point, we have number. Yes? The number one. The number one. Now, a specific number, this is an interesting question whether some numbers are more basic than other numbers, but let's say that one object is the number, the type number, or a point. Anything else as a guess? So these are the only... Yes? A line. A line. Now, is a point more basic than a line? A line is made out of points. We'll get to a line as well. So now we have points and numbers. How many of you think the basic, the most basic object is the number? Raise your hand. Some of you. Some of you. How about the point? The majority of you. Now, for me, there is no difference between points and numbers. We'll be going today back and forth between what you may call algebra and what you may call geometry. Numbers are just the names of the points, the labels of the points. And the points are the locations of the numbers. So for me, it's the same thing, points and numbers. If you want to think of points in the plane, then a point in the plane is described by two numbers. You give me a point, I can calculate the two coordinates, two numbers. You give me these two numbers, I can draw a point. We go back and forth between points and numbers. Now, the next suggestion was a line. What is more complicated than a point? A line is made out of points in the most straightforward way possible. Now we move to lines. How do you describe a line? Yes? Two points connected. Two points, yes. You take two points, two points, maybe one line is one zero and two one, you connect them, you join them, you create a line. This is a way to draw a line if you have a geometric mindset. Now, this is the geometric description of a line. How do you translate this to algebra? What is the algebraic way to talk about a line? Yes? A function of x. A function of x which is of special type? In this case, a linear. linear function, yes, absolutely, a linear function. So a line is the graph of a linear function, unless the line is vertical. It has this equation, y equals a number times x plus another number, a linear equation and the line, this is the same thing. If you have more of an algebraic mindset, if you walked out of an algebra class, maybe you answered number in the previous question, and here you're thinking of a linear equation. If you walked out of a geometry class, then maybe you answered point, and now you're drawing a line by connecting two points. Now, let's uh, discuss a little bit the equation of the line. The first coefficient is called the slope of the line, the Steigung der Linie. Now, the slope, what is the slope in this particular example? How do you calculate the slope? Yes? It's the difference in y coordinates divided by the difference in x coordinates. Absolutely, the difference is in the y coordinates divided by the difference in the x coordinates. So, 1 minus 0 divided by 2 minus minus 1. In this case, what is the value of this slope? 
Yes? One third. One third. Absolutely, the slope is one third. And what is the other coefficient? Now, you have to use that the line passes through the point minus one zero. Let's use minus one zero. So if you plug in x to be minus one, y should be zero. So what is the coefficient in the other box? Yes? Mm, check it again more carefully. Yes? Two thirds. Mm, two thirds. Try again. Yes? One third, yes. If you plug in x equals minus one, you should get zero. These two coefficients are equal. They're not always equal for any line, but when the line passes through minus one zero, the two coefficients are equal. So this is the equation of a line. Algebraic geometers think interchangeably. Sometimes we think of a line geometrically, sometimes we think of a linear equation. Now, let's continue. What is the next complicated object, starting from point and then a line? And then, what is next? Let's say if we stay within the plane, yes? Oh, okay. I, I would have said plane. Plane. Aha! If you go, you can go to the plane. If you increase the dimension, you can go to a plane, yes? This is one direction in which to add degrees of complication, yes? A triangle. A triangle is made out of lines, yes? A triangle is made out of lines. That's, um, that's also the case. You can also consider a triangle as the next complicated object. Yes? A circle is another answer. So from a line you can go in different directions. You can build triangles from several lines. You can build planes from lines. You can build planes or you can draw a circle. For our purposes, let's look at the circle. Now, circle, you describe it geometrically. It's all the points that are the same distance from a given point. What is the algebraic way? How do you encode a circle algebraically? What is the algebraic description of a circle? Yes? Absolutely, x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared, in this case equals 1. Absolutely, this is the equation of a circle. If you think of a line as given by a linear equation, x and y have degree 1, this has degree 2. X, you have x squared and y squared. And here you have the circle. Now let me remind you, if you have a point on the circle, you draw perpendiculars, the legs of this triangle are x and y. So when the radius is 1, then by the Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. If you have a point outside of the circle, well then x squared plus y squared is not equal to 1. So this is the equation of a circle. Now, how is the equation useful? Let me ask a basic question. Is this point on this circle? I give you a point. Is it on the circle? You're not going to draw the point and then try to zoom in to check empirically if it's on the circle, how do you tell if the point is on the circle? Yes? You square both values, add them, if they equal one, it is? It Absolutely! If you square the values, add them, if you get one, then it is on the circle. One nine plus eight over nine is one, therefore the point is on the circle. Now you can draw it on the circle. Now, again, we'll be going back and forth. I have to convince you that there is a good reason to do that, to establish this dictionary. When is algebra going to be more useful, and when is geometry going to be more useful? Algebra is more useful when you want to get things done, to check something, to play with the equation, to prove something, check some identity, open some brackets, have some equation. In this case, you square the values, add them up, equals, this equals one, therefore you conclude the point is in the circle. Geometry is more useful to guide you. You have intuition in the world of geometry, because if you look around, you're surrounded by geometry, you grew up with geometry, and that's where you have your intuition. Now, my goal for this talk is to convince you how these two interact. And I will do that by the following problem. Take the set of positive integers. These are the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. There is no zero, no minus one, no minus two, no fractions, no three quarters, no square roots, the most basic numbers, positive integers. And let's generate examples of a, b, and c positive integers, which satisfy this Pythagorean equation. 
the sum of the squares of where we have there, that's not, of a and b, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In other words, give me examples of triangles, right triangles, all of whose sides are integers. Now, you have some proposal. Yes? 3, 4, and 5. Absolutely. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. You're all familiar with this. It shows up in your geometry problems all the time. You have this right triangle. But now, we want to generate more examples. Yes? 6, 8, and 10. Six, eight, and ten. Absolutely. This is the next simplest example. 6 squared plus 8 squared equals 10 squared. Now, these two examples, if we look at these two examples, we may say that they're, well, surely they're different examples, technically speaking, but can I say that they're essentially the same example? Yes? I mean, it's just each one of the numbers multiplied by a constant. Number. Absolutely. Each one of the numbers 3, 4, and 5 gets multiplied by 2. If you multiply each of them by 2, then you will again get a Pythagorean triple. Or if you think of a right triangle with legs 3 and 4 and hypotenuse 5, you scale everything by 2, you still get a right triangle with legs 6, 8, and 10. In this way, if you want, you can generate as many examples as you wish. Next example, if I scale 3, 4, and 5 each by a factor of 3, I'll get 9, 12, and 15. You can scale each of them by a factor of 100. So you're generating examples, but are these examples substantially different? No, you can say that they're, this is essentially one example, just one example. Now, let's say you want to generate more examples of Pythagorean triples. Maybe you're familiar with some more. We'll generate really complicated ones today, actually. Yes? Absolutely! 12, 13, 12, 5, and 13. If you add up 5 square and 12 square, you get 13 square. Absolutely! Now, this is another example that shows up in your textbooks. If you want, you can start scaling the tree, but we don't have to do it. You will get essentially the same example. Does anyone know another example? Yes? 7, 24, 25. Right, yes, yes, you can generate, right here I have included another one, 8 squared plus 15 squared equals 17 squared. So you can generate more and more examples, but let's see if you're not familiar with them, or if you want to generate really complicated ones, or if you want to generate all the examples. Maybe you want to make a list containing all the examples, there will be infinitely many by the way, but you want to include them all in a list. Now, you want to continue this table horizontally. You're not interested in going downwards and scaling. How would you do that? Even 8, 15, and 17, how would you guess that? And then if you want more complicated examples, just by guessing. Now, let me emphasize, by guessing it's not going to work. Let me emphasize, A, B, and C have to be integers. If you try A to be 2 and B to be 3, can't do that because 4 plus 9 is 13, which is not the perfect square. Square root of 13 here is not allowed. Now, if you want, if you want just to try random numbers a and b, if you just plug in some random number for a and some random number for b, it's not going to work. I can demonstrate. So let's see here. Mm, give me another, give me a random value for A, let's say above 30. Someone from this side. Uh, four. Four. Let's say above 30. 58. 58. So I take 58 square. Okay. Then give me another number from this side. 31, I take 31 square equals. Now, let's add the 2, plus 3, 3, 6, 4, equals. Yes, and then if I take square root of that, 4, 3, 2, 5, 
It's not a perfect square. There is no chance that you get the perfect square. Even if you spend hours playing this, you will not get a perfect square. So you have to, you have to give a mathematical argument. Here is how we approach it. Start with the equation. We want to solve that equation. Now, if you are an algebraist, or let's say a number theorist, you look at this equation, you enjoy the equation, and then maybe you bring the b squared to the right, and then maybe you factor c minus b times c plus b. There are many ways, by the way, to solve this equation. There are many approaches. But if you're an algebraic geometer, you may divide both sides by c squared, rewrite the equation in this way, so now it's one quantity, a over c squared, plus another quantity, b over c squared. And then, if x is this first fraction, a over c, and y is the second fraction, y over c, the equation becomes x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, x and y are rational numbers. Rational means fractions of integers. They have denominators, like 3 over 5 or 7 over 20. Rational numbers, fractions. But what is the benefit of this equation now? Yes? It's the equation of the circle. Yes, absolutely. This is the equation of the circle with center at the origin and radius 1. This is the equation of the unit circle. So now we are going from the initial equation to this circle. I have to convince you that this is helpful. We are going to this circle. If we look at your example from before, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Let's see how this dictionary that we established on the top line allows us to interpret geometrically this equality. Dictionary from the top line. Yes? Ah, yes, yes, we'll get the point. Absolutely, divide both sides by 5 squared. So we write it as 3 over 5 squared plus 4 over 5 squared equals 1. You may say, why would I go from the left to the right? What is the benefit of this? The benefit is that now you have a point on the circle. The, the two numbers, when you square them, they add up to 1. You have a point on the circle. And this is a very convenient way to visualize the equality. Your other example, 5, 12, and 13. You divide by 13 squared. And now you have a solution to the equation of the circle. In other words, you have a point on the circle. 5 over 13, 12 over 13. Last computation, 15 squared plus 8 squared equals 17 squared. Divide by 17 squared. This gives you a point on the circle. And this little picture is a snapshot of all of your computations. Remember we had this long slide from before with our examples and identities. And these are all captured here. And something very useful, remember with 3, 4, and 5, we were generating a whole lot of other solutions by scaling. What happens with these other solutions? Where do we draw them on this picture? Same point. Same point, absolutely. So solutions that we were calling essentially the same, which were obtained just by scaling the three numbers by the same factor, they land at the same point. That's very convenient. If we really want different solutions, we see different points. Essentially the same solutions land at the same point. Now, let me remind you what we were doing. Find examples of A, B, and C, which satisfy the Pythagorean equation. And now we translate this. We translate this, yes? Excellent, yes. Point and rational points on the circle. Absolutely. Find examples of x and y, rationals, that satisfy the equation of the circle. Absolutely. What is your name? Julian. Julian. Now, Julian is saying that satisfy the equation of the circle, but he's thinking of the, the equation of the circle as the circle. You can even say find examples of rational points on the circle. Points where both coordinates are rational. That's what we would call a rational point. Normally we talk about rational numbers, but you can also talk about rational points. Now, both coordinates are rational. If you plug in a random x, again, if you just take a random x, random rational number in the equation of the circle and you solve for y, I can bet there will be a square root. You will not produce a rational point. 
both of the coordinates have to be rational. So now we have to generate rational points on the circle. And we have translated the original problem to this problem about the circle and the rational points. Algebraic geometry is more than just a dictionary going from algebra to geometry and back. I have to convince you why this whole circle idea is useful. Just the translation is not going to make the problem easy. It's just the translation. If you start with a difficult philosophy text in German, if you translate it to English, it's still a difficult text, just translate it. So now we still have a difficult problem but it's now geometric. We have found these three points, we want to generate more. And here is the brilliant idea. Take a point, minus one zero, which you look at as a pivot point. You will be based at that point. Now, when I say generate po rational points on the circle, I really mean in this arc in the first quadrant, because let's say for you all the numbers are positive, so you're interested in this arc. Imagine that you stay at that point, and then you're trying to hunt for rational points. How would you pick a rational point? Now, let's say you connect minus one zero with one of these points that we have already found. You connect it. So you draw this line. The line was the second most basic object. Remember, some of you were proposing a line at the very beginning. You just join them. What can you say about the equation of this line? Let's say, for starters, just the slope. What can you say about the slope? Yes? Three quarters. It will be three quarters, yes. So the slope is the difference in the y-coordinates divided by the difference in the x-coordinates. In this case, well, let's say one half. One half. If you do it more carefully, yeah. you get one half. Now, I can uh, connect minus one zero with that other point. What is the slope in this case? What is the formula for the slope? Yes? Absolutely, the difference in the y values divided by the difference in the x values. And now when you cancel one over 13, what do you get? You can uh, do it, yes? Two thirds, you get two thirds. So you can calculate these slopes. We'll see why this is useful and what it has to do with generating Pythagorean triples. Now, I want you now to be lazy mathematicians. I connect this point with our third example. And now, don't calculate. You didn't like this, you know, you didn't like the 13 in the denominator already, now you have a 17. So let's not calculate it exactly. Tell me something about the slope just on a qualitative basis. Just based on general principles. What can you say about this slope without specifying the value, yes? It's less than one half. It's less than one half, yes. The slope tells you how steep the line is. The slope in this case is positive. Zero would mean horizontal line, so it's positive, but less than one half. So it tells you you can compare with one half. Excellent. What else can you say about the slope? Yes? It's rational. It's rational. The slope, excellent. Thank you, thank you. The slope is a rational number. If you connect two rational points by a line, well, then the slope is the difference in the y coordinate divided by the difference in the x coordinate. So upstairs you have difference of two rationals. Downstairs, you have difference of two rationals. When you divide, you will get a rational. The slope will be rational. That's the punchline here. If you want, you can calculate it exactly. One quarter. The one quarter is not as important as it is that the slope is automatically rational. So if you're based at minus one zero, and if you look at the direction of a rational point, the line you create has rational slope. Now, you are at minus one zero, and you try to generate a rational point. You try to guess a rational point. What can you do? What approach can you take? Yes? 
You can take a line with the rational slope and then hope that it hits the circle again at the rational point. Absolutely. So let's try with the line with slope 1 over 10. This is a line with the rational slope. Let's see where it intersects the circle again. If you were to take a line with an irrational slope, there is no way to get a rational point there. And now you take a line with a rational slope. Hopefully, this point that you create, which I mark red, is rational. At the moment, it's not obvious whether or not it will be rational. We don't see. We don't see at the moment. We don't know at the moment whether or not this point is rational. But you made this guess. There is a good chance that it ends up rational. That would be great. Then this will generate for you another rational point on the circle or another solution of the Pythagorean equation. So now, now we have to do some harder work. This is the conceptual idea. Now, hard work, let's figure out if this red point is rational. There we go. You have the circle of radius 1. Circle of radius 1. Then you stay at minus 1, 0. Through this point, you draw the line with slope 1 tenth. And then you intersect the circle again at this red point. Is this red point rational? Does it have its coordinates rational numbers? Let's figure it out. It's not obvious. It's not obvious at this point. But by the way, by the way, after a little bit of discussion, it will be obvious. Now, it could be maybe this point has rational or not rational coordinates. But maybe the problem is with the one tenth. Is it that no matter which rational slope you take, you always hit a rational point? We'll figure this out. We'll figure all of this out. Now, how do you calculate? How do you calculate the coordinates of this point? What do you have to do? What is your approach to that? Yes? Can we define a function for the line? For the line. So represent the line algebraically as a the graph of a linear function. In other words, find the equation of the line. We talked about the line. A line has an equation, and we never separate the two. So let's figure out as a first step, absolutely, for starters, let's find the equation of this line. y is equal to. What is the first coefficient there? This is a very easy question, yes? One tenth. This is the slope. That's what the slope is. And what is the second question? You know that this line has slope one tenth, and it passes through minus one zero. Yes? One tenth again. When it passes through minus one zero, the two coefficients are equal. So we figured out the equation of the line. Now, I will make a remark here. Now we learned something about this red point already. Let's make sure we appreciate what we know at that stage before we continue with the calculation, because the calculation may get more complicated. We don't know this yet. Let's see what we know already at this stage. If the first coordinate of the red point is x, then, since the red point is on this line, the second coordinate is 1 over 10 times x plus 1 over 10. What can you conclude? Yes? Yeah. The second coordinate will immediately be rational as well. Because the second coordinate is just the first divided by 10, plus 1 over 10. And the question now is whether the first coordinate is rational or not. The rationality of the first coordinate means rationality of both coordinates. Now, how are we going to figure out x? How are we going to find x? This point, the red point, is the intersection of the line, we have used that it is on the line, with the circle. It's the second intersection point of the line with the circle. How are we going to find x? We need to find x to see if it's rational or not. By the way, in the end of the discussion, you'll be able to tell immediately if x is rational or not without actually finding x. We'll get there. But now let's find it, yes? And we also have the equation of the circle. Excellent! We also have the equation of the circle. x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now we have to use the equation of the circle. 
and that this point is on the circle. So we have to solve this equation. x, the, take the square of the first coordinate, plus the square of the second coordinate, equals 1. We have to solve this equation. This is the equation of the circle. Now, let's work it out. You have to, you have to solve this equation. You have to simplify, or you have to figure out x at some point. Maybe you don't like that there is a denominator, you maybe you don't like that you have two terms and then the sum is squared, but let's rewrite this equation in a nicer way. What happens when you simplify the equation? So let's say when you open the brackets, the first term will be x squared over 100 and then the 100 and when you clean the you know, when you clear denominators you get the 100 x square from the first term plus another x square so what is the equation that you actually get after you go to a common denominator you expand yes it will be a second degree equation absolutely it will be a quadratic equation this is the all important information about the equation, it will be a quadratic equation. Yes, thank you, thank you. Now, let's write down the equation exactly. The coefficient of x squared, so you get 100 x squared plus 1, 101 x squared, and then you have 2x divided by 100 when you open the brackets, and then in the end you have 1 over 100, but then you multiply by 100, so you get minus 99, and this is your quadratic equation. Absolutely. Now we have to solve this quadratic equation. We are reduced to solving the quadratic equation. How do you solve the quadratic equation? How do you solve this quadratic equation? Yes? We use the formula. You have a formula for the quadratic equation. The formula reads minus b plus minus square root of the discriminant divided by 2 times a. Yes? You have a formula for that. I agree. This is one way to solve a quadratic equation. What is another way? Yes? Uh, look, this is the geometric interpretation of solving the equation. You look at the parabola and you figure out, want to figure out where it intersects the x-axis. Yes? Aha, uh -huh, you can complete the square. You can start off and then you write it as a difference of two squares and you write it. This is a little bit of unpleasant work. Yes, I agree. This is guaranteed to work. If you're willing to write down the quadratic formula, you will accomplish you will get the solutions, yes? Uh, isn't there also a formula uh, x1 plus x2 equals b over... Aha, there is a formula for the sum of the two solutions and for the product of the two solutions. I'm not sure how it's called in English. Vieta's formulas, oh, Vieta's okay. formulas. Yes, there is. But then what are the solutions? Excellent, yes. That's a good observation. You have Vieta's formulas as well. You know a lot about the quadratic equations. But here I want you to be a little more sneaky. Can you do it with avoiding the unpleasant work? Yes? Minus 9? 11 and minus 9. No, they're not. But uh, I agree. I agree with Vieta's formula. If you can guess two numbers whose sum is the right thing and whose product is the right thing from Vieta's formula, these are the solutions. This is yet another way to solve quadratic equations, if you're lucky and if you can guess the two numbers. Here, though, yes? We can divide the equation by our solution. We can divide the equation by? Uh, x plus 1 x plus 1. Aha! So you noticed that you noticed that one of the solutions is x, x equals minus, minus one. 1. Absolutely. What is your name? Uh, Elias. Elias. So you noticed that minus 1 is a solution. You can do it just by plugging in minus 1. You can guess if you plug in x to be minus 1 there. You, then you get 101 times 1, minus 2, minus 99, and you manifestly get 0. 
So you can guess that minus one is a solution. It's very easy when you guess one of the solutions. Very easy. Now, this is one way, but can you see, so I agree, x1 is minus one. Can you also see that geometrically? Can you see immediately that x equals minus one should be a solution without even bothering to simplify the equation, yes? Absolutely, the line and the circle intersect already at minus one zero. So minus one, for geometric reasons, has, has to be a solution because minus one zero is on the line and on the circle. So without doing any work, you can immediately see that minus one is a solution. If you want, you can check on the equation or geometrically. You have a point, so you have a solution. It's much easier to solve a quadratic equation when you already know one of its roots. You have to do half of solving a quadratic equation because half of the problem is solved already. You have one of the solutions, minus one. Now, what is then the other solution? That's a very easy question when you have one of the solutions. Yes? Yes, but in this case, we already found minus one is one solution. So the other solution you can get for free very quickly. Yes? Expand the equation. You don't have to do much. Oops. You, don't, you don't have to do much. You don't have to do much. When one solution is there, then you use Vieta's formulas, as you suggested before. The product of the two roots is given to you by Vieta's formula. You don't have to do that if you don't want. You can do the quadratic formula argument. But you just don't have to. You, can, you have this shortcut here. The product of the roots is minus 9 over 101. Are uh, all of you familiar with Vieta's formula? So the product of the two roots is minus 99 over 101. It's the last coefficient divided by the leading coefficient. And um, so this is the, the, the formula for the product. You don't have to. If you want, you can just solve it. You can extract a factor of x plus 1 and then figure out the other factor. One way or another, you solve x2 is 99 over 101. So this x2 is the x-coordinate of the red point. There we go, it's rational. It's rational. Now, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back here. The moment x1 is minus 1, the moment you figure out x1 is minus 1, is it obvious at this point even without solving for x2. You didn't like very much solving for x2. I can see that. But you solved, you figured out x1. Is it obvious that x2 is going to be rational as well? Yes. Without doing any work. On a conceptual basis, x2 has to be rational. Why is that? Because you only use rational numbers to figure it out. You only use rational so numbers to... The coefficients in the equation are rational, but we have to be careful because if you play around with rational numbers and you create equations with rational coefficients, you can very easily leave the world of rational numbers. You can write an equation like x squared minus 2, and then the solution is no longer rational. Just because the coefficients are rational doesn't mean that you're staying within the world of rationals when it comes to the solutions. But here, one of the solutions happens to be rational. Is it automatic that the second solution will also be rational? Yes? Yes, because of Vieta's formula. Yes, because of Vieta's formula. That's one argument, yes, using Vieta's formula. Absolutely, that's how we did it when you multiply the two. And then all the coefficients are rational, and the product is rational. x1 is minus 1, x2 will also be rational. If you like the quadratic formula, then x1 is minus b minus square root of the discriminant divided by 2a. And here you have no square root. There is no square root involved. Therefore, the discriminant is a perfect square. 
just by looking at one of the roots. If it's rational, then the discriminant must have been a perfect square. And therefore, the second root is also going to be rational because you use the same discriminant just with a plus in the formula. So either using the Atlas formula or using the quadratic formula argument with the discriminant, when one root is rational, immediately the second root is rational. Therefore, one way or another, x2 is rational. You go there, this is x2. And then the y-coordinate we set is immediately also going to be rational. So the y-coordinate, you know, to x2, you have to add 1. So you get 200 divided by 101. Divide by 10, 20 over 101. You found this red point with coordinates. They are manifestly rational. We computed that directly, explicitly. If you want, here you can check that these two squares add up to 1. We don't have to check because 99 over 101 came up as a solution to this equation. <laughs> Better satisfy the equation. This is equal to 1. Or if you clean, clear the denominator, you get this solution, 99, 20, and 101, to the original Pythagorean equation. Again, here, the punchline is when you have a line with a rational slope, the slope is rational, and if it passes through one rational point, then to find the other point, you're looking at the quadratic equation, which already has one rational solution, just coming from the intersection. You have a rational point on the circle and on the line. And when the slope is rational, you get this, well, you get a quadratic equation with one rational solution. The other solution immediately has to be rational as well. So you're guaranteed that you will hit a rational point. And that's how you describe all the rational points on this circle by taking lines through minus one zero of rational slope. You don't have to take one tenth, you can take any other rational number. You will always hit rational points. There are many, infinitely many, but you describe all of them in this way. So, to finish, here's my final question for you. Would you call this slide here algebra? in conventional terms, or would you call it geometry? How would you describe it? You're a little shaky. Yes? Algebra, because you may say it's algebra because we got this quadratic equation there, and we opened the brackets, and we simplified the equation, and we worked with the equation of a line, equation of the circle. But then we also have this intersection point. And the way we solved the equation, by the way, we got the first solution from the geometry, from the intersection of the line and the circle. So solving this equation, halfway, we used a geometric argument. And then for the other root, we used an algebraic argument. When you start getting confused whether you would call this algebra or geometry. I'm very happy to see that you're confused on that. It means that we have entered the world of algebraic geometry. This is a glimpse of what algebraic geometry is like. And the goal of this talk is therefore accomplished. Thank you. Now, a very quick um, announcement here. Just a moment. A very quick announcement. We have a program at ETH. We have classes for high school students on topics beyond the regular curriculum. So this is not uh, directed in any way towards uh, school materials, school exams. It's independent also from the university curriculum. It's, we call it extracurricular mathematics, creative thinking and rigorous proofs. This is what we emphasize. We have several levels. On Wednesdays, we have the intro level. Intro level takes place on Wednesdays, starting next week. On Thursdays, we have an intermediate level. Mm, the intermediate level is also accessible to everyone without prior background, but it goes a little faster and the material is cumulative. 
for the Wednesday classes, you can attend casually. If you have busy schedules, you can attend, and then if you miss a week, it's not going to be a problem. So we have these going on at all times. There is no cost, no credit. People do it just for their own intellectual satisfaction. This is if you are interested in mathematics to go in more depth. And uh, this is the web page, but the easiest is just to Google ETH Math Youth Academy. You're welcome to, to attend. Again, this is for those of you who want more mathematics. And those of you who have solid background from school and just want to be challenged. Thank you everyone and I wish you a successful visit to ETH and a good year.